Higher Geography Population Unit. In this unit, we'll be covering the methods and problems of collecting population data. We'll be looking at the consequences of different population structures and we'll be looking at two case studies to cover forced and voluntary migration. Population data refers to social and economic information collected on the people living in a country. It may include matters such as employment, income, health, whether they have access to clean water, how they travel to work and birth and death rates. While it's expensive and difficult to collect information on everyone living in a country, this information is vital to allow governments to plan how best to spend their money to improve people's lives. The first part of the population unit looks at how population data is collected. A key way of collecting population data is through a census. This is where every household is sent a booklet of questions which they have to fill in. In Scotland, the General Register Office is responsible for collecting information through a census every 10 years. Another method is civil registration. Events such as births, deaths and marriages have to be registered by law within a few weeks of them occurring. The Home Office is responsible for monitoring immigration and four times a year they release statistics showing the number of people applying for citizenship, asylum and visas. You could also talk about methods that other countries use to collect population data. The Tax Office in Norway, for example, administers a national registry which holds information on everyone who is or has been resident in Norway. This is used to collect information on their population as well as being used as an electoral roll and a tax register. In China, they carry out a mini census between full censuses with information collected on 1% of the population. Another question you might be asked to answer is why some developing countries find it difficult to collect population data. For this question, you should be giving as many examples and reasons as possible. So for example, one of the things you could talk about is literacy rate, because if a country's got a low literacy rate, it means that people will struggle to fill in the census form. One example of that is in Afghanistan, where only 43% of the population are literate. Another reason that you could talk about is if there's lots of languages spoken in a country. This again makes it more expensive because the census form needs to be translated into lots of different languages. A good example of this is India, which has 30 languages with more than a million native speakers and 122 languages with over 10,000 native speakers. The list here gives other reasons you might mention, including war and conflict, migration and cost. You should be able to talk about a good range of these and give relevant examples whenever possible. Another aspect of population that you will need to be able to explain is the consequences of different population structures. Population structures are different in developing and developed countries. Let's start by looking at Malawi, a developing country in West Africa. As you can see, Malawi's population pyramid has got a wide base, so this means that it's got a high birth rate and a large number of young people. As a consequence, the government will have to put a lot of money into services for young people, including immunisation programmes, education and maternity hospitals. So as you can see, at the moment, this country has got a relatively low number of economically active people. But as these young people grow up, the number of economically active people will increase. This could be an advantage because the large workforce may attract multinational companies to the country increasing their tax revenues, but it could also be a disadvantage as it may lead to high unemployment and more competition for jobs. With many young people, this population is growing. More people will require more food, which may put pressure on farmland, and more housing, which may lead to the growth of shanty towns. As a result, government policies may encourage smaller families, maybe by promoting the use of birth control or by raising the school leaving age. Now let's contrast this with the population structure of a developed country, in this instance, Japan. Japan has a very different population structure to Malawi. The narrow base means that there is a relatively low birth rate and a small number of young people. As a result, some services for young people may need to close, such as maternity hospitals or schools. While this saves the government money, in some areas it could lead to long journey times. While currently there are quite a lot of people in the economically active section, soon this will start to decrease as this group of people reach retirement age. On the positive side, this might lead to a drop in unemployment, but it could also lead to a skills and labour shortage and less taxes being paid. 
This is worrying the Japanese government, as a higher life expectancy will lead to more elderly people and an increasing cost of pensions. As well as needing services such as care homes, older people typically require more medical care, such as hip replacements and heart surgeries, which is expensive. This may lead to difficult decisions about how this should be funded and the retirement age may need to be raised or taxes increased. In-migration would provide more economically active people but may lead to tensions between different groups. People may be encouraged to invest more in private pensions. Some hospitals in Japan are already experimenting with using robots to reduce the number of staff needed. Another key aspect of population that you need to be able to talk about is migration. Migration is the movement of people from one permanent home to another. For higher geography, you need to be able to discuss the causes and impacts of voluntary and forced migration. You'll need to look at two case studies. One should be an example of voluntary migration, where people choose to leave in search of opportunities elsewhere. So when explaining this, you should include both push factors that encourage people to leave their home and pull factors that entice them to the new country. These factors can be environmental, economic or social, and some examples are listed on this slide. However, an answer that simply listed these points wouldn't score highly, as you have to show a good knowledge of your case study. One of the case studies you might use for voluntary migration is migration from Mexico to the USA, and your answer would need to give specific examples of the push and pull factors you're talking about. To explain poverty as a push factor in the Mexico to USA case study, you could say that many Mexican migrants come from poor rural areas where most people work in farming. Arid conditions and poor quality land mean that it is difficult to make a living from farming, resulting in 42% of Mexicans living in poverty in 2018. Another push factor is poor living conditions. In Mexico, weak regulations mean that the water systems that run through many rural towns are dangerously polluted. Children are particularly vulnerable to the fluoride and arsenic that pollute some of the drinking water, putting them at risk of health complications. In terms of pool factors, many Mexicans moved to the US for the higher wages available. In 2020, the average monthly wage in the US was nearly $4,200, whereas in Mexico, it was only $1,600 US dollars a month. Mexicans are also enticed to the US for better educational opportunities. In the US, children spend on average just over 13 years in school, whereas in Mexico, it's under nine years. You also need to be able to talk about the impact of migration on both the country that the migrants are leaving from and the one that they're going to. First, we'll take a look at the impacts on the receiving or gaining country, in this case, the USA. This slide shows you some of these impacts. As you can see, there are positive and negative sides to all of them. Once again, it's not enough to simply list them. You need to relate them to your specific case study. For instance, migrants from Mexico who are desperate for work will typically be willing to take on low-skilled, low-wage jobs. This can put downwards pressure on wages and lead to American workers being replaced with cheaper migrant labour. As well as increasing poverty in the US, this can lead to tension between migrants and locals. Even where Mexican migrants are working legally and paying taxes, they often send a lot of the money they earn back to their families in Mexico rather than spending it in America, which can affect the US's economy. On the plus side, however, Mexican migrants often take the low-paying, menial jobs which many Americans are reluctant to take themselves. At times of low unemployment, this can be an advantage. And as for the migrants, these jobs still offer higher wages than they'd earn in Mexico. And there are other positive economic and social impacts. One obvious example is that Mexican-themed food has become incredibly popular in America, with burrito and taco fast food shops opening across the country. Another is that, as most migrants are young adults, it reduces the dependency ratio in the US and adds in more tax-paying adults. You also need to be able to discuss the impact of migration on the donor or losing country, in this case Mexico. There are advantages and disadvantages, but it's not enough just to list them. You need to be able to explain the impact on your specific case study area. The money sent back to Mexico by migrants is helping its economy greatly, as people now have money to spend on goods and services. It's estimated that remittances make up 2% of Mexico's GDP. As people move out of Mexico, pressure on land, health services and jobs is being relieved. 
However, when the young and skilled workforce leave, this can result in a shortage of workers to fill these jobs. It can also result in an increase in the dependency ratio. A loss of farmers may mean that Mexico doesn't grow enough food for itself as the country relies heavily on homegrown products. Your second case study should be an example of forced migration, where people are forced to leave their country out of fear for their lives, maybe because of famine or natural disasters or war. One case study that you may use for your forced migration case study is Syria, which has experienced a vicious civil war since 2011. To gain high marks for these questions, you should be able to explain what the risks to people's lives were. In Syria, thousands of people have been killed in mortar attacks, aerial strikes and shelling. Chemical weapons have been used against towns, such as chlorine bombs and sulphur mustard. All parties in the conflict have been accused of war crimes by the UN and of causing civilian suffering, such as blocking access to food, water and health services through sieges. For the pull factors, you could look at why people have chosen to move to a particular country. As you can see, most Syrian refugees settled in countries as close to Syria as possible, as travelling as a refugee is difficult and refugees hope to go back home again as soon as possible. Many refugees have chosen to move to a country which speaks Arabic, such as Lebanon, Jordan or Iraq, which would make it easier for the Syrian refugees to communicate. Many other refugees have chosen instead the country with the strongest economic growth in the area, Turkey, which increases their chances of earning a living. Forced migration can have a significant impact on the receiving country, and these can be political as well as social, economic and environmental. As before, it's not enough to just give a list of these. You would have to explain them in relation to your case study. Having accepted 1.5 million Syrian refugees by 2020, Lebanon has the highest number of refugees per capita in the world. This has had significant effects on jobs and wages. As the number of refugees has grown, there's been downward pressure on wages and local people have been likely to lose their jobs to Syrian refugees. In Lebanon, 55% of people now qualify as poor and extreme poverty is at 28%. The influx of refugees also puts pressure on housing and it has caused rents in some places in Lebanon to triple in cost. On the plus side though, the arrival of aid agencies has injected new money into the local economy and local businesses have benefited from the supply of cheap labour. You also need to consider the impact of forced migration on the donor or losing country, in this case Syria. For example, as skilled workers leave, Syria no longer has enough doctors to take care of the remaining population. As workers leave, tax revenue will drop and the economy suffers. In 2010, Syria's GDP per capita was 3,000 American dollars. In 2020, it was only 870 American dollars. These are some questions that have come up on the population topic in the past three years. Remember that in all population exam questions, you will gain marks for giving specific, relevant examples to back up your points. <laughs> <laughs>